A couple of years ago, a student society organised a debate about abortion at Christchurch College, Oxford. Two men were invited to speak, one for, one against. But then the women's campaign of the University Students' Union protested. It is absurd to think, they said, that we should be listening to two cisgender men debate about what people with uteruses should be doing with their bodies. Cisgender, in case you're wondering, means people who identify with the gender they were born with. Responding to student demands, the college cancelled the event at the last minute. One of the speakers, Tim Stanley, was already at Paddington Station, waiting for his train to Oxford. He had been denied an audience by an activist practice called No Platforming. This programme, one of five on free speech, examines how this vital freedom is being eroded in the place it should be most secure, in universities. It's not just cisgender men who get no platformed. Last year, the radical feminist Julie Bindell was invited to speak by Manchester University's Free Speech and Secular Society. The subject was From Liberation to Censorship. Does modern feminism have a problem with free speech? But then she was, well, censored by the University Students' Union on the grounds that allowing her to speak was potentially in breach of our safe space policy. What made them feel unsafe was Julie Bindell's views on transgender people and her opinion that an operation would not on its own turn a man into a woman. Her views could incite hatred towards an exclusion of transgender people on campus said these student censors. Bindell wrote a vigorous repost, concluding no student was harmed in the writing of this article. And here she is describing what she sees as the wider chilling effect of repeated attempts to deny her a platform. Well, my crime goes back to 2004 and it was one article. And here is the reason why I'm disinvited. On the grounds of transphobia, whorephobia, biphobia, Islamophobia, any phobia they can think of. I think I've been accused of phobic phobia. But the problem I have isn't that my, my earning capacity has been reduced. It hasn't affected my career. In one way, it's given me a bigger platform outside of the UK. It's the young students and other young feminists who see what's happened to me, the bullying, the harassment, the libel, the slander, as a warning to shut the F up. So what's going on here? One of the ten free speech principles that I have proposed says, we allow no taboos against the spread of knowledge. The great liberal philosopher John Stuart Mill famously argued that we need free speech in order to get at the truth and the good sword of truth can only be kept sharp when it's constantly tested against extreme and even false arguments. Universities should therefore be places where the widest possible range of views, including extreme and offensive ones, can be heard and then contested with robust civility. Yet in recent years they found their position as havens of free speech in the pursuit of knowledge under attack from within and without. The British government, as part of its counter radicalization policy, has been trying to impose on universities a duty to prevent the expression of extreme views on campus, rather than the classic liberal answer of contesting those extreme views in free and fair debate. John Stuart Mill would be protesting outside number 10. In a way even more worrying is the challenge from within from a generation of students, most of whom have grown up in some of the most liberal and open societies history has known. Here, for example, is Stephanie Kelly, an American student at Oxford, defending an attempt to no platform the veteran feminist Germaine Greer. Germaine Greer essentially said that trans women aren't real women. And while she says, and many would agree with her, that these statements are innocuous, these statements are one's personal opinion, she is as she says, perfectly within her legal right to say them. She is not immune from criticism. She is also not guaranteed a platform to privilege that voice within a university space. As someone who has many trans and non-conforming gender friends, I know that the rhetoric that Jermaine Greer uses is directly alike to that of the physical and verbal attacks that my friends face daily. These things aren't alike. Free speech 
is not equal. The free speech of a powerful person is definitely not the same as the free speech rights to a woman of color, for example. We don't live in a society where there are safe spaces. Stephanie highlights some of the key words of no platforming: privilege, power, harm, the right to a safe space. Now, obviously, universities and student societies are under no obligation to invite anyone to speak, and no one is obliged to go and listen to that speaker if they do. We're not considering a compulsory lecture. Rather, no platforming means that one group of students is being prevented from hearing something they do want to hear because another group of students doesn't want that voice to be heard. It is, of course, an established principle in an open society. That free speech may be limited when it will cause harm. Incitement to violence, for example, is a crime also in Stephanie's homeland of the First Amendment. But the no platformers indulge an inflated rhetoric of harm, long on assertion and short on evidence. Like much of the new social censorship in the West, this blurs the line between demonstrable, objective harm and the purely subjective act. Of someone taking offence. When we talk about offence, we mean about three different things. Tim Squirrel, PhD student and former president of the Cambridge Union. One is just feeling, you know, vaguely uncomfortable. Another is about political offence, views which we, which speaks truth to power. And the third kind of offence is about genuinely feeling visceral discomfort about views which are expressed. So. Notably, it's it's not just that these speakers say things which are a bit off. They are often people who deny the experiences of people who、uh, are transgender and say that their experiences are illegitimate or never happened. I think that is just as hurtful as if they had come up to them and punched them in the face. Really? Surely we must distinguish between even the most offensive verbal insult and a real punch in the face. Then there's that claim for safe spaces. Universities must certainly ensure the physical safety of their students. We should also be concerned for their psychological well-being. More broadly, where there is constantly repeated abuse, racist, sexist, or otherwise, in circumstances where it's widely disseminated and cannot be effectively countered, speech may need to be limited on grounds not merely of physical, but of psychological harm. Yet this extreme situation is very far away from the life of a student in Manchester or Cambridge. A British university is not Rwanda on the eve of genocide. But what about leaders of xenophobic parties coming to visit? That is the sound of healthy protest going on outside the Oxford Union. When it invited Marine Le Pen, the leader of France's far-right anti-immigrant Front National, to speak in the university's famous debating chamber, Tim Squirrel thinks they shouldn't have given her a platform. Saying we want to give a platform to Marine Le Pen says to Muslim students or students of colour who suffered、uh, racist abuse or oppression within society, which is still broadly racist, that. Their experiences of oppression are less important than the ability of someone who is essentially a fascist、um, to come to a prestigious society and espouse their views in front of a large audience and be inadequately challenged. I think that it is more important to prioritise the identities and the comfort of students within a place that is their home for three years. There is still a huge disparity between your ability to challenge and their ability to espouse those views. I disagree. I think the Oxford Union was right to invite her. Le Pen's views are obnoxious, but she's a major political figure in France. Indeed, the one who's making the running in French politics at the moment. We need to know what she's like and what she's on about. In the event she was given a platform by the Oxford Union, fiercely challenged outside and then inside the chamber by articulate questioners, and the French media reported it all, and the slogan of safe space. Can also be used to try to impose what free speech scholars call the heckler's veto.
But also you've got again, lovely please, British bodies killing beautiful girls oh, well. like Mohammed and Wazi. At Goldsmiths College in London, the Atheist Secularist and Humanist Society invited the Iranian-born human rights activist Mariam Namazi, a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims, to address them. The Islamic Society protested that her presence would be, I quote, a violation to our safe space. The talk went ahead, but a number of male members of the Islamic Society sat in the front row and constantly interrupted the female speaker. Can you stop interrupting? Not here, right? The postmodernist leftists who are pushing the line. Here we're bound to ask who's intimidating whom? Now, I'm very far from maintaining that all these new forms of student demand are violations of free speech. Take the Roads Must Fall movement, for example, which agitated to have a statue of Cecil Rhodes high up on a college building on Oxford's High Street removed to a museum where the racist imperialist could be put in his proper context. Some people complained this was a blow against free speech. I disagreed with the demand to remove the statue, But I don't think it's closing down free speech to suggest that a monument should be moved to another location. Siswe Mapofu Walsh, a graduate student from South Africa and a leading light in the Roads Must Fall camp, makes the case eloquently. Well, I think it's a spurious criticism of Roads Must Fall that we are limiting freedom of speech. Um, We don't believe that statues and inanimate objects enjoy the right of freedom of speech. Our point is that Rhodes is emblematic of a whole nexus of issues. So we think that the glorification of Rhodes is deeply problematic and we need to unpick why people defend him so vehemently. Because since Rhodes Must Fall started, Oxford has has been embroiled in a very important debate about how it presents its history, about the representation of students of colour, about the curriculum. So if anything, we've opened up free speech. We have challenged a long-held and long-cherished dogma, and we have had the bravery to say it. This is a quite reasonable suggestion, but we must say no to no platforming. Earlier this year, an online petition gathered nearly 600,000 signatures for excluding Donald Trump, the leading Republican presidential candidate, from the UK. What we should do is invite him to address a student union. Let him speak. Let there be protests outside, and then let his critics challenge him, exposing his prejudices, picking apart threadbare arguments, and puncturing his braggadocio. That is how universities advance knowledge, through free speech. The chants of protesters may be audible through the windows of the hall, but inside, the voice of the speaker must be heard. A university campus, like the chamber of a democratic parliament, should be distinguished by civilised self-regulation of speech to enable the highest quality of debate. But a university is the last place on earth where the individual's subjective I'm offended veto or the heckler's veto, let alone the assassin's veto, should ever be allowed to prevail. Timothy Carton-Ash on Free Speech. The producer was Nina Robertson.